Thank you so much, Pastor. I'm glad to call him friend. He invited us to come. My wife and I are guests this morning. How many of you are guests? Somebody invited you to come to Cleveland Baptist Church. We're going to raise our hands. If you're a guest and somebody invited you, would you raise your hand? We're glad to see you. I can tell you I've been here twice. And these people at Cleveland Baptist Church will treat you so many ways, you're bound to like one of them and you'll keep coming. I can tell you that. This is a warm-hearted place in a cold area right now in the month of March, but we're just thrilled to be here. Please meet my wife. Her name is Regina. The word Regina means queen. I married her so I can be a king. Thank you very much. And stand right there and say hello, baby doll. God's given us three children. Yeah, amen. God has given us three children, Ben, Beth, and Becky, and they're all serving the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, two of our children have children. We have five grandchildren. How many of you are grandparents? Raise your hand. God bless you, bunch of old people. <laughs> Good to see you in church this morning. Grandchildren are God's rewards to you for not killing your kids. You know that. We let ours live. They're still bearing fruit. We're having a wonderful time. The young man who played the violin this morning, I think you're supposed to call him a violinist, but I listened very carefully. I'm from the South. We call those people like that fiddlers. That's what we call them. He played that thing so much, I was getting ready to go get a fire extinguisher. I thought that thing was going to blow up. His brother, according to Brother Paul, was saved into my ministry down in Titusville, so I've already had a wonderful morning. We're excited about being with you this week, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Friday night, Bible Prophecy Night. We'll be looking at the coming of Jesus Christ. I'll give you an excerpt of that this morning as we study the Word of God together. Take your Bible, please, and turn with me to the book of 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians, and go with me to chapter number 5. If you do not have a Bible, somebody near you has one, and you can look on with them. There's probably a pew Bible in front of you, and we're going to the book of 2 Corinthians. Would you stand, please, out of respect for the preaching and teaching of the Word of God. Thank you so much for coming. We look forward to fellowshipping with you after the service and having you back during the process of the week. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, I'm down in verse 20. The Bible says... Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be reconciled unto God. For he, that's God, hath made him, that's Jesus, to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Chapter 6 and verse 1. We then, as workers together with him, beseech you also that you receive not the grace of God in vain. For he saith... I've heard thee in a time accepted. In the day of salvation have I succored thee, tried to help thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Amazingly enough, I did not tell the specialist this morning as they sang what I was going to preach on, but they preached my message, I got saved. You may be here today and you're not absolutely certain you're going to heaven. If you listen carefully, open your heart like the front door in your house, you can leave this building with an absolute certainty that you're on your way to heaven. We're going to talk this morning about the most important decision you'll ever make in your life. Thank you very much. You may be seated. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we enter your gates with thanksgiving, your courts with praise. We bless you for who you are. We thank you. You want more today for this service than I could want. I claim the anointing and filling of the Holy Ghost of God on the basis of Ephesians 5.18. I pray Acts 26, 18, to open their eyes, turn them from darkness to light, and from the power of Satan unto God. Don't let anybody leave this building without knowing beyond a shadow of a doubt that they're saved. In Jesus' name, amen. You make thousands of decisions every day. What time you'll get up, what you'll have for breakfast, what time you'll go to work or school, what you'll do when you get home. You make bigger decisions. What are you going to do when you graduate? Will you get married? Will you go off to college? Will you enter the business world? Where will you live? Who will you marry? How long will you be in that occupation? We make decisions every day. Almost all of our decisions are about our body. But the most important decision you'll ever make is not about your body, it's about your soul. The Bible teaches that you're not primarily a body with a soul, you're actually a soul with a body. God made man the living soul. There was a time you were not, but there'll never be a time you will not be for as long as God lives, you're going to live for eternity. Jesus said in Mark 8, 36, what will it profit a man if he gained the whole world and lose his own soul? 
What will a man give in exchange for his soul? So the most important decision you'll ever make in your entire life is the decision to trust Jesus Christ and get saved as we heard sung today. The apostle Paul said now's the accepted time. It means the welcome time. Now is the day of salvation. When Jesus and his disciples spoke of salvation, it was always in the present tense. Whatever you age you are, do that today. You this morning in the privacy of your seat can receive Jesus Christ, make the most important decision you've ever made, and go to your car knowing you're on your way to heaven. Why would Jesus use the term twice now? Number one, because of the certainty of death. Death is inevitable. Over 1,200 times in the Bible, God uses the word dead, dead, or dying. Genesis 2.17. Of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest of it, thou shalt surely die. We are going to die. Ecclesiastes 3, 1 and 2 to everything, there's a season. A time for every purpose unto heaven. A time to be born, we've had that. A time to die, we'll experience that. Ecclesiastes 8, 8, no man hath power over the spirit to retain the spirit, neither hath he power in the day of death. You may be able to bench press 400 pounds, sir, but when death comes, he'll take you in the first round. Ecclesiastes 9, 5, all the living know they shall die. Every time your heart pumps and rests, it whispers to your mind to die, to die. Psalm 89, 48, what man is he that shall live and not see death? Romans 5, 12, for as by one man sin entered in the world, and death passed upon, and death by sin. So then death passed upon all men, for that all have sin. Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. The statistics are in, ladies and gentlemen, one out of one die. I was preaching in Tennessee. A 21-year-old young man came to church. He was not the least bit interested in what I was preaching and basically made fun of me on his way out the building, not knowing this would be the last chance he would ever have to be saved. Today, could you be your last now? On Thursday, he played a pickup game of basketball, decided to drag race with a friend, lost control, hit a concrete post, snapped his neck, on Saturday, when we were pulling out to go to the next meeting, they were pulling in with the hurts. He passed his now. Today is your day. I was preaching in South Carolina. I shook hands with one of the men in his 50s. And that evening when I walked back in, the pastor said, you remember so-and-so that you spoke to this morning? I said, yes, sir. He said, this afternoon at 2 o'clock, he dropped dead. Death comes at the most inconvenient times. I was preaching in the state of Florida. We had our RV parked at this church because the place where we were at another church had no place to park. I did a youth gathering. Little did they know that a young lady who was invited and cursed and said she wanted nothing to do with God would only have that opportunity. That was Friday night. On Monday night, I was preaching in the church where my RV was parked. I finished the service, went back out to my RV, and that evening a friend of mine who rides his bike every night saw that girl back out, pull out very quickly, lose control of the car, go over an embankment, her head hit the, the windshield, she went out into eternity. Friday night she had an opportunity to make the most important choice in her life. Monday night the opportunity was gone. Good friend, there is no choice after death. When you die, it's appointed then for the judgment. But preacher, I was taught that after you die, if you're not good enough to go to heaven and you're not bad enough to go to heaven, hell, then you'll have a second chance. You can go to a place called purgatory. Here's the problem. The Bible never speaks of purgatory anywhere. The place of purging, which is what that means, is Calvary, and Jesus wants you to go there today. He wants you to receive the gift of eternal life. God loves you. Death is coming. You have to make the most important decision before you ever leave life. Number one, God says now because of the certainty of death. Number two, because of the closeness of the return of Jesus Christ. If you have your Bible, turn with me please to the book of 2 Thessalonians and go to chapter number two. For those of you that may not be familiar with this term, the return of Jesus Christ, we know he came once. Isaiah 7, 14 forecasted it. 
It fulfilled in Luke 2, 11, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. As surely as Jesus came one time, so he has said he is coming again. The Bible says in John 14, 1, let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions, if it were not so, would have told you. Jesus is speaking. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. If God has his way in your life today, you'll get saved and receive the finished work of Jesus to take away your sin. God doesn't want anybody to go to hell. When he returns, which could be this morning, he wants everybody to be ready. You have seen the sign, be ready. Titus 2.13, looking for that blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we believe the coming of Christ is very, very close. In Matthew chapter 24, Jesus was asked in verse 3, Lord, what will be the sign of your coming at the end of the world or the end of the age? Jesus said, watch for these things. One, many will come in my name, saying I'm Christ, and deceive many. Since his ascension, no less than a thousand people have proclaimed themselves Messiah. In my lifetime, David Koresh, Jim Jones, and others, watch for that. He said there's going to be wars and rumors of wars. Over a hundred wars fought last year. We're still at war in Iraq, Afghanistan. They're looking to develop the nuclear warheads both in North Korea and in Iran. You're a button or a flip of a switch, people going out into eternity by the millions. Jesus said, watch for that. He said there are going to be famines just Friday on the news. They, are, they say in the UN there are 20 million people in four different countries that right now are on the brink of starvation. They're saying starvation is moving at an unprecedented rate and people are going out into eternity because they're starving to death. Jesus said, watch for that. He said there are going to be pestilence, plagues. And many of you have heard of AIDS and SARS and the bird flu. And it seems that it's sweeping like a prairie fire. Watch for that. He said there's going to be earthquakes. They're going to take place in different locations. The world every day is shaking. You hear almost nothing about it until it's four points, something on the rector scale. And then all of a sudden you look in China, Iran, you look over in Turkey, you look there and you'll see it as the quarter of a million people die in the tsunami. Now Jesus said when you see all this come to pass, when it lines up like lights on a runway, you lift up your eyes, your redemption draws nigh. Some of you are sitting here saying, well, preacher, what you just gave from the Bible appears to be happening in my lifetime. It's as relevant as the daily news. Good friend, many of you are thinking his coming is close. Well, the coming of Jesus Christ in the clouds to take home everybody who is saved is closer than what I gave you in Matthew 24. Matthew 24 refers to a time when Jesus will come back to planet earth, every eye will see him. But the book of 1 Thessalonians tells us that Jesus Christ is coming in the clouds. It reads this way, The Lord himself shall descend from heaven. There'll be a shout, voice of the archangel, trump of God. The dead in Christ, those who got saved before they died, will rise first. Then we, we who have been biblically saved, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, so shall we ever be with the Lord. What is happening is this. The return of Jesus, the resurrection of those who died in Christ, and then the rapture or the catching up or the taking away of all of us who are genuinely saved. Here's how it could happen. If Jesus Christ came while I went preaching, you may be sitting there saying, I've never heard anything like this. Take a moment to look down and look back up and I'm not here. I'm not trying to exaggerate. God said it'll be in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. That is faster than you can close and reopen your eye. You would then look around and say, where is the person that brought me? They're gone. You would see the vast majority of people in this auditorium. They're gone. What has taken place? Christ has come and every genuine born-again believer has been taken to be with him. What happens when we declare war on a nation? We always remove our people before we go to war with them. God is declaring war on planet earth with those who've declared war on him. But he doesn't want anybody in this room to be left behind. 
God wants to make peace and will through the blood of Jesus Christ if you'll repent and believe the gospel. But when we're gone, then all hell breaks loose on planet earth. Now, the Bible teaches this. There will come an antichrist. He will be the counterfeit of the true Jesus Christ. Have you ever stopped to think that you can believe what the Bible teaches about the true Jesus Christ, receive the gift of eternal life, and be sure when Christ comes that you will go. But if you do not receive the true Jesus Christ and you're left behind, then you will be deceived by the counterfeit Christ. He'll be a one-world ruler with a one-world ecclesiastical and economic system. I personally believe he's alive today. Now, please listen carefully this morning. Do you realize if you in this age of grace or this Sunday morning understand how to be saved, and you will, and you knowingly reject Jesus Christ, there will come a time when Christ comes and you're left that you cannot and will not be saved. What I want to warn you of this morning is what the Bible is teaching. You can't get saved anytime you won't. Jesus said, now is the accepted time. Now, when Paul wrote the second time to the church at Thessalonica, he warned them of that. Please look down at verse number 9 of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. He's speaking here of the Antichrist. Even him who's coming is after the working of Satan, the energy and empowerment of Satan, with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish. Now, the word perish there can also be found in your Bible in John 3.16. God loves you and is not willing that you perish or die and go to hell. But these people have not received Christ and they will perish. Read on. Because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. Do you know God wants for you what you'd want for yourself if you totally understood God? God doesn't want you to die in your sin. He doesn't want you to spend an eternity away from him. Jesus Christ came, and every moment he was here, he was saying, I love you. But these people turned down the love of the truth. Read, please, verse 11. For this cause God shall send them, those who would not be saved, that they should believe the lie, that they all, not some, all, might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. There is coming a time, friend, your now will be gone. Somebody said today is the date on God's calendar. Tomorrow is the date on the fool's calendar. Jesus always says, consider your soul today. Are you 12 or are you 20? Are you 52? Consider your soul today. You're going to live somewhere forever. Now, these people did not receive God's love. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, put your name there, that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever you put your name there believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God did not come to damn you, friend. God came to deliver you. God does not want you in hell. God wants you in heaven. That's the whole purpose of Jesus. The Bible tells us he who knew no sin, that's Jesus, became sin for us so we might be made the righteousness of God in him. But God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Most of you in this building have seen a picture of the crucifixion. Do you realize the six hours one Friday that Jesus Christ, God in a human, be in a human body, died there? Every moment he was there with blood coming out of his body, he was declaring, I love you. I love you. Nobody has ever loved you like Jesus loved you. And I beseech you in Jesus' name, don't turn down the love of Jesus Christ. But they also did not receive the truth. I want to give you three quick truths this morning that will help you to know whether or not you're going to heaven. Here's truth number one. It is the word sin. Everybody say the word, please. Sin. The Bible says in Galatians 3 and verse 22, the scriptures conclude all under sin. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The word sin means to miss the mark. Let me ask you a question. I wonder if there's anybody in this building who thinks you have met the standard of perfection and holiness. You see, my good friend, Revelation 21.27 says there is nothing that enters heaven that will defile it. When you and I were born, we were born short 
away from and unable to attain in our own work the majesty, perfection, and holiness of God. Now, here's the teaching of the Bible. No sin, none of yours or mine, will ever enter heaven. If you die in your sin, you cannot get in the kingdom of God. There is no chance. Man came to me and he said, I'm going to heaven because I keep the Ten Commandments. And I said to him, that's interesting, name them. He's still trying. He started with this. He said, uh, God helps those that help themselves. I said, that's not in the Bible anywhere. He said, do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. I said, that is in the New Testament, but not in Exodus chapter 20. He said, that's the only two I know. I, let me give you this morning three commandments and see how well you do. The Bible says, thou shalt not covet the Ten Commandments. Would anybody here in this building like to say, I have never wanted anything that wasn't mine? There's a problem that's called strike one. We've all been covetous. The Bible says, thou shalt not bear false witness, the Ninth Commandment. Would anybody like to say, I've never in my entire life told a lie? About the time you said that, you would tell a lie. And so we know that's not true. The Bible says, thou shalt not steal. Would anybody like to say, I've never taken anything from anybody, including an answer from somebody else's paper? That would make you a lying, thieving, covetous individual. And I didn't give you the other seven. Now, here's the teaching of the Bible. No sin, not one sin, not any sin has any access into heaven, and the Bible says before you can get saved, delivered, or rescued, you must understand sin. Word number two, sentence. Would you say that word, please? Sentence. The Bible says in Romans 6, 23, the wages or the payment for sin is death. Now, in the Bible, death is not annihilation. No, death in the Bible is separation. This hand is your body, and this hand is your soul. Were you to die today, your soul would come out of your body. You do not cease to exist. You have simply stopped existing on planet Earth. But if you die without Jesus Christ, your soul will be separated from God for eternity. You say, preacher, how do you know? Listen to the words of Jesus. Luke 16, 23. The rich man also died and was buried. There's his body. And in hell he lift up his eyes. Now, wait a minute, how did he lift up his eyes in hell if he died? That's what I'm trying to tell you. You never cease to exist. When you die physically, your soul is separated from your body. But if you die without being saved, your soul is separated from God for eternity. Jesus goes on. He lift up his eyes being in torments. He seeth Abraham afar off, Lazarus in his bosom. He cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy upon me. And send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tortured, tormented in this flame. Abraham said, Son, remember. Here's what you learn about hell. It's a real place with real people who are experiencing real pain. Everybody who goes to hell is alive, awake, and aware. Why would Jesus have made that statement and told that true story? Its setting was he was preaching to the most religious people in town. He was speaking to the Pharisees. Now, let me ask you a question. Do you fast two out of every seven days? The Pharisees did. Do you give 10% of everything you own? The Pharisees did. Do you have Bible verses in your clothing? The Pharisees did. And what Jesus said was this. You guys will never go to my heaven. You're religious, but you're not righteous. And the whole setting on the message of hell was to religious people. You see, my friend, God is not interested in your religion. That's what you do for Him. God's interested in a relationship. That's what God does for you. No religion will get you one second in heaven. But when you get saved and your sins are forgiven and you're delivered, there's an alternate term in that called born again, born from above, born of God, and you get a relationship with Him. Preacher, do you believe that hell has biblical fire. Mark 9, 43, I'm quoting Jesus. If your hand offends you, cut it off. Be better if you go in the kingdom of heaven maimed than having two hands to go to hell into the fire that shall never be quenched. Where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. If your foot offends you, cut it off. It'd be better if you go in the kingdom of heaven halt than having two feet to go into hell. 
into the fire that shall never be quenched, where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. If your eye offends you, pluck it out. It'd be better if you go in the kingdom of heaven with one eye than having two eyes to go to hell, into the fire that shall never be quenched, where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. Six times, good friend, the Jesus of the Bible who made hell and does not want you in hell warned everybody that hell has fire. It is not a symbol, it's a reality. When my wife and I were celebrating a major anniversary, we were in Tennessee at an amusement park. We went and watched the blacksmith as he did his trade. Behind him was an open fire, and in, 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 on the top of it, it read 2,500 degrees. I said, Regina, can you imagine somebody picking you up and putting you in 2,500 degrees and you stay there for one moment, 60 minutes, your sins then are forgiven and you get out. She looked at me and she said, but according to the Bible, you don't go for 60 seconds. No, my friend, you don't go for 60 years or 60 billion years. You go for eternity. And so I say to you this morning, the reason Jesus is lovingly giving you this message and telling you now is the accepted time is because there is a time when you die and go out into eternity and there's also a time when Christ comes and you're left behind. Now, if you're left behind, the Bible says this, because they didn't receive the love, you've learned of his love, of the truth. Truth one, sin. Truth two, sentence. Here's a wonderful truth, sacrifice. Would you say that word? Sacrifice. When Jesus was on the cross, he was substituting for you and me. We'd been in the game of life, we're behind and no chance to win. God the Father said to God the Son, Son, step in the game of life. You're the only pure, holy person that's ever lived. And so therefore he was born and lived absolutely sinless. And when he died, he did not die for his sin. His sacrifice was for our sin. He who knew no sin, never thought it, never said it, never did it, became sin for us. It's a very simple verse. Sinless Jesus, sinful us. That we might be made, that is a key word, M-A-D-E, the righteousness of God in him. Now, good friend, have you ever heard anybody say, if you're going to heaven, you have to be good? Did you know that's true? You have to be just as good as God. I have a question. What are you going to do to become just as good as God? Do you think if you came today and this pastor were to put you in this baptistry and push you down and bring you back up, you would become as good as God because of water? Do you think somebody can pray over a piece of bread and you can swallow it and you'll be just as good of God because of what you swallow? Do you think if you quoted two complete paragraphs word perfect, you would become just as good of God because of what you said? Yet, ladies and gentlemen, please understand this. It is not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy, He saved us. If you're trusting any work that you have ever accomplished, baptism, catechism, going to church, Baptist, Catholic, Methodist, Presbyterian, if you're trusting anything that you've ever done to go to heaven, you're not going to heaven. It is not, my friend, what you do for Jesus. It's the gift of God and what God does for you. The Bible says in Mark 1, 15, repent. It means to change your mind. Have you ever trusted baby baptism? Study your Bible. No baby in the entire Bible was ever baptized to go to heaven. Change your mind if you're going to be saved. Have you ever trusted confirmation? Study your Bible. Confirmation in the Bible refers to spiritual growth, never deals with salvation. Change your mind. Have you ever trusted going to church or your works? It is not by your works, but it's the mercy of God. You cannot, my friend, change your life, but you can change your mind. And then he said, and believe. That means transfer all of your trust to the one who's trustworthy. Come to Jesus Christ for who he is. Good friend, Jesus Christ is not a God. He's the only God. Jesus Christ did not die for his sin. He died for our sin. Jesus Christ did not come to make you better. Jesus Christ came to take us sinners and completely wipe away and cleanse our sins and make us new people because only He can make us acceptable unto Him. Now watch carefully. There's a lot of people who are over here 
And they will agree Jesus died, was buried, and raised again and think they're going to heaven. Good friend, if you're going to heaven because of that, Satan's going to heaven. Because Satan believed Jesus died, was buried, and raised again. He's not going and neither are you. That's his historical fact. But when you come over here and you realize Christ loves you, shed his blood for you, died for you, was buried for you, and raised again for you, you move from historical to personal. Do you have a historical Jesus today? You're not going to heaven. But you can have a personal Jesus today when you understand your sin has separated you from God. But his sacrifice has paid in full out of a heart of love so that you could be saved. You come by faith. For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Romans 10, 13 says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. In a moment when we close this message, in your seat without joining one thing, you today can get saved. You today can open your heart like the front door in your house. You today can say, Jesus, I am a sinner for whom you died. I am heading for hell, but I want your mercy. I want your forgiveness. I want you, and Jesus has promised he will save you. Now, preacher, let's suppose what you're saying is wrong. Let's suppose that you could get saved after the coming of Jesus, so let's suppose I'm wrong. All of a sudden, I'm preaching, you don't see me, you look around, a lot of people are gone. Now, all of a sudden, you're not sitting there going, he's almost done. I didn't want to come to this meeting anyway. I don't agree with that man. Suddenly, it's a reality. You look around, the vast majority of people are gone. You say, well, he told us it was going to happen. And you kneel down and say, dear God, this was not a joke. This was a reality. Now, please save me. According to this passage, he will not because you heard the gospel and said no. But let's suppose I'm wrong. Do you have any earthly idea what you're about to face? According to Revelation chapter 16, all of the oceans are going to turn blood red and everything's going to die. According to Revelation chapter 16, all the fresh water is going to turn not like blood, but to blood. And people will be forced to drink it. According to Revelation 16, the sun, 93 million miles away, will scorch men and women in the city streets and they will be burned alive. You say, if that ever happens, I'll get saved. Not according to the Bible. Because if you will not repent this morning, you will not repent in that day. The Bible says you'll blaspheme. According to Revelation 16, there's coming an earthquake that will be worldwide. It will flatten all the mountains and it will sink every island. Why would I tell you that? Good friend, you do not want to gamble with your soul. Today is the day of salvation, the certainty of death, the closeness of the coming of Jesus, and finally, the possibility of becoming a reprobate. Take your Bible in closing this morning and go to the book of Romans chapter 1. The Romans chapter 1. What God is doing today is giving you some truth. Sin, sentence, sacrifice. You can make the choice. Not to choose is to choose. But you can leave the building this morning without becoming a Baptist. You can leave the building this morning by becoming a born-again believer in Jesus Christ. Now, somebody said, Preacher, I can get saved anytime I want. Not according to Romans chapter 1. I want to read, please, verse number 18. The Bible says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because, verse 19, that which may be known of God is manifested in them, for God has shown it unto them. Would you look this way, please? If you did not have a Bible, you would know there is a God from creation. You cannot have creation without a creator. I was preaching in China. Girls were sitting in front of me who were atheists and communists. And I said to them, have you ever wondered how you got to planet Earth? One of the educated girls said, we believe in evolution. I said, well, ask me how I got my watch. She said, how you get your watch? I said, one day I was looking down and two hairs crossed a freckle. There was an explosion on my wrist and I got a watch. She said, that foolish, that not true. I said, it's just as true as the Big Bang. She said, we want to talk to you. All the girls came to my daughter's room where she was teaching and they learned that day that there is a creator and everybody in this building knows that. You did not happen, God planted you here. Second, you have a conscience. 
Now this morning you may have picked up your bulletin and tried to avoid what I'm saying and trying to read through that, but the Word of God is still going to you and your conscience is whispering, He's right. Your conscience is saying you need to be saved. God does that because He loves you and doesn't want you to be left hopeless. He cares about your soul, so He, the judge of the universe, sets up a pulpit in your conscience and whispers to you sin, sentence, sacrifice, and salvation. You'll never forget it even though you're not saved. You can be saved today. And then there's Christ. What is the purpose of Christ leaving heaven if it wasn't to give us eternal life? He didn't come to make you a better person. He came to save your soul. So here's what happens. God reveals what does man do. Look in verse 21. Because when they knew God, they glorified not as God, neither were thankful, became vain in their imaginations. God says, come, man says, no. God says, come, man says, no. Lest I miss my guess, there's probably somebody here this morning who's heard a message like this. To this point, you've said no. And you've always felt, when I'm ready, I have a question, how do you know when you're ready? Well, I'll do it on my deathbed. About 99 out of 100 never have that chance. You're gambling with the most prized possession you have called your soul. You do not know you'll live to see your deathbed. You may be in a coma and not even know when you pass from this life. You're gambling with your soul. So what does man do? God says come, man says no. God says come, man says no. The average American thinks, I'll get ready and I'll get saved, but I want you to notice please verse 24. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own flesh. Verse 26, for this cause God gave them up to vile affections. Verse 28, even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind. I want you to see three times the same thing. God says, come, man says, no. And so God says, last time I'm going to call. Man said, I'll take my chance. God said, you are done. I'll never deal with you again. I'll never convict you. I'll never draw you again. The Bible says in Proverbs 29 and verse 1, He that being often reproved and hardens his neck shall suddenly be destroyed and that without remedy. So what happens? You come to a service like this. God lovingly puts you under conviction or in your words makes you very uncomfortable. He does that because he's trying to get your attention saying, I love you. You don't want to die the way you're living today. You have an opportunity, you stand and say, I'll never be back to this church again. I have no desire to have that. And as you walk to the parking lot, God says, I'll never speak to you again. Preacher, is that possible? Oh, my friends, the first time I saw it, I was at a camp. They brought a young man, 16 years of age, to camp. He was not a bad guy. He just wasn't interested. He would check his watch and always kind of couldn't wait till the services were over. The next year he was brought back and forced to come, this time completely different. He put his head down, put his fingers in his ears. I was three feet from where this happened, a friend of mine was preaching. His buddy, 17 years of age, came over, reached out to him out of a heart of love, grabbed him by the shirt and said, please go be saved. I don't want you to die and go to hell, I want you to be saved. That young man took his two fists and rammed them in the chest of his friend, and he said, you leave me alone, I'll go to hell if I want to. Cold chills came down my back. I wept as I paced back and forth, and I said, I may have met the first person that God ever gave up on. To my knowledge, he's never again wanted to be saved. He's never again had any heart for the things of God. I was preaching in this state. On my left-hand side was a cop. I said to the pastor, who is that man? He said, he's one of the meanest guys you've ever met. He said, I'm surprised he's here. I preached a message like this. He got angry. If you're angry today, it just means you're not saved because everybody who's going to heaven is cheering for me right now while I'm preaching because they don't want anybody to be left behind. They want you to go to heaven. We want you to go to heaven with us. When I stood at the door where the man came by, I handed him a gospel leaflet and he threw it down. His wife came by and I handed her the leaflet and I said, would you give this to your husband? She said, he will beat me up in the car. I said, no ma'am, he will not. You blame me, tell him I love him and Jesus died for him. A hundred people witnessed this. He walked back in, walked through the lobby, walked up to me and took that track that his wife had given him, crumpled it and slammed it in my chest and cursed me verbally. It stunned the people at church. 
pastor apologized. I said, no need for an apology. I used to run with people like that. Let's go visit him. The next night, we went to visit. He was not there, but his son was. Don't miss this upstairs and down. Some of you do not understand. You could get saved, and some of your children will. Or you can stay unsaved and take your children to hell with you. You'll never go to hell by yourself. You'll never go to hell by yourself. I witnessed to a 21-year-old young man. While I was witnessing to him, he was not interested. He was not hostile, just not interested. About that time, the back door opened and in walked that cop and his wife. When I stood up, he began to lace me with profanity. I turned to leave and he is still cursing me. One time in my ministry, just once. I turned and said, Mr., was there ever a day in your life you wanted to get saved? He put his head down and mumbled, I can't answer that. I said, sir, you better answer that. You're going to meet a holy God. I dropped on my knees and I prayed that God would give him another chance. Then I stood up and I said, you have cussed me and my God for the last time. I'm leaving your house. I crawled in the front seat. The pastor crawled in to drive. He said, why did you say that to that man? I said, sir, I don't know, but he may be a reprobate. He may have rejected God and God's rejected him. He said, Brother Farrell, 10 years ago, I brought an evangelist here. He gave the gospel. The man looked like he was ready to receive Jesus. He bowed his head and then looked up like he would had a demon. And he shouted, I won't do it. And he said, for the last 10 years, he's been exactly like you saw. I said, Pastor, it may be that when he said no to God, God said no to him. I beseech you in the name of Jesus Christ, understand you're going to die. Jesus is coming, and understand you don't get saved when you won't. Today is the day of salvation. I want you to think about this as I close this morning. Let's suppose Jesus came and closed this service. Let's suppose he didn't bring the rejoice hymnal, but he brought the book of life. Let's suppose he comes and tells me to sit down by my wife. I'm no better than anybody in this building. Jesus said, now I'm going to read aloud the names of everybody in this building who's going to heaven. And when I call your name, you stand because I'm going to take you to heaven today. But if I do not call your name and you're still seated when I'm finished, Jesus Christ said, because you are not written in this book, I'm going to cast you in the lake of fire. One stands, another stands, another stands. You've been angry with me, but you're not angry now. All of a sudden, your hands are perspiring. And you're thinking to himself, that old man tried to tell me this was coming. The last name is called. The book of life is closed. Jesus said, now those of you who are standing, I'm taking you today to heaven. You made the most important decision you've ever made. You've been saved. And I have given you eternal life. The rest of you who are still sitting, you will never go to heaven. You're without hope in this world. Everybody in this building has an answer upstairs and down. Would you be sitting or standing? Can you prove from the Word of God that your name is in the book of life? I'm through with this. I want to thank you for coming. I'm praying today you'll make the most important decision you've ever made. I met an old-fashioned evangelist years ago named J. Harold Smith. He preached a message entitled God's Three Deadlines. He gave an illustration that I checked and found out was absolutely true. He was preaching in Louisiana. Over to his left-hand side, three businessmen came not to listen they came to laugh. And they made fun while the man was preaching the Word of God. The opportunity came for people to receive Jesus, and many did, but they made fun of those who were receiving Jesus. Smith looked at the back and he said, you three men, I don't know who you are, but I believe you've crossed God's deadline. God's going to kill you. He documented his evidence. In 24 hours, all three men were dead. The first of the three who mocked God put his key to go into his office at 8 a.m., Dropped dead from a heart attack. Second of the three men was crossing to have lunch at 11.30. Dropped dead in the middle of the highway from a heart attack. Third of the three men who made fun of God was sitting in his office scared out of his mind. It's too late now. He turned down God and God turned him down. He looked at his secretary and said last night, my two friends and I went and made fun of God. That evangelist told us God was going to kill us. He said, my two friends are already dead and in hell. He said, I'll be in hell before it's dark. The woman witnessed and testified later that he doubled over and died in front of her. The night before, three men were told by God now. Three men said to, no, said to God, no. And God said to three men, never. Ladies and gentlemen, today is the day of salvation. Is your name in the book of life? 
Let's bow our heads to pray all across this house.